Good morning. Uh, my name is Frederick Mulder and I am a biblical scholar living in Winchester and I started a evangelical platform YouTube channel recently as a means of encouraging evangelical scholars, theologians, vicars and however you want to call them, uh, mainly here in the United Kingdom. Um, today I want to give us a historical perspective or background to the recent contra controversial issue of Dr. John Shepherd who does not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, uh, but nonetheless was appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury to go and represent the Anglican Communion in Rome. So what I want to try and paint for us is how it is possible that within a Protestant church, uh, you can be in a senior position, you can be appointed in a senior position, despite the fact that you do not believe in the empty tomb uh, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now, before I go into the historical background within the Church of England, uh, just one or two broad observations first. Of course, not believing in the bodily resurrection of Jesus goes back all the way to the early church. We have a number of Gnostic texts in the second, third century, Gnostic Gospels, we had Marcion, uh, we had a couple of interesting renouncements of but the bodily resurrection. And of course, we also had the skeptics like Celsus and Origen who took him on in the early church and Augustine who also later on took him on. And then of course, after the enlightenment uh, and the Protestant Reformation, we have a number of other examples as well of theolo theologians, scholars who did not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Just briefly, if we go back to Germany, you've got Samuel Ray Morris, uh, who referred to it as a fraud. You have Gotthard E. Lessing that focused on this huge gap between us and past events. We have D.F. Strauss who brought in the idea of myth. Uh, and then uh, after that you had uh, what we call higher criticism that moved into the Anglo-Saxon traditions where we then had um, a couple of initial first waves of liberalism uh, which culminated in the, the the figures that I would like to focus on here for for the purpose of this YouTube. So I hope you're going to enjoy it. Uh, it is a controversial conversation and if you've got any additional information or corrections you are more than welcome to leave a comment on the YouTube channel uh, so that we can have a fruitful good dialogue about all these developments. So the first interesting development that I think that's relevant is uh, Hensley Hansen, 1912. He was ordained. Uh, he became, uh, I think, the canon of Durham uh, Cathedral. And at the time there was controversy surrounding his appointment because he wrote that there should be scope or room for vicars and bishops to doubt or disbelieve the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Nonetheless, he was appointed there as uh, in a senior position. Then we have, in 1910, the ordination of William Temple, the famous William Temple, who became Archbishop of Canterbury during the Second World War. Uh, interestingly about Temple was that he wrestled with the resurrection of Jesus, and uh, apparently there was a bishop who refused to ordain him due to his sceptical and controversial views. Temple went to another bishop who was willing to ordain him, and then he became uh, a very influential scholar uh, later on, as I said, the Archbishop. And uh, another little footnote that's interesting, um, Dr. Ed Lone from Australia recently published a monograph where letters, correspondence between him and other friends were published, in which he stated quite unequivocally that he believes the, 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 the line between orthodoxy and liberal, liberalism should be taken away, if you may, and sort of embrace it as all as part of one large church. Uh, and of course, then uh, William Temple, in a sense, became also kind of like a enigmatic figure for liberals in the church who, who founded uh, societies in his name. You had one in Hong Kong in the early 1950s and a couple of others as well. And that was often used as a springboard and a foundation for critical engagement and scholarship. Then we have uh, 
Bishop Ernest Barnes, 1947. He became Bishop of Birmingham and he uh, controversially uh, stated he does not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And of course, you had evangelicals who criticized him and uh, uh, there was some uproar in the media, even all the way to Hong Kong, where you had uh, 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 Anglican ordinant called uh, uh, Michael Golder, who was upset about it. And he wrote a, a defense of the bodily resurrection in uh, the St. John's Review uh, in, in Hong Kong against the, the Bishop Ernest Barnes. Uh, another very interesting figure is Geoffrey Lampy. I hope I get that pronunciation right. Lampy. Now, he uh, uh, became controversial uh, and this book, The Resurrection by Lampy and McKinnon, was later published uh, where he basically argued in the media that the empty tomb in the Gospels should be regarded as myth. So he claimed he believes in the resurrection, but he did not believe in the bodily nature of it. There was some kind of a spiritual theological truth to it that he believed in. And he was allowed to go on and proclaim these views. Evangelicals rejected it, but he was not disciplined. Uh, he also uh, was the canon of Ely Cathedral uh, with, one would imagine, oversight over ordinance and so on. Now, the next person is also a very interesting figure. I've got his book here, uh, Hugh Montefiore. And this is his very controversial monograph, Oh God, What Next by Hugh Montefiore. He was, of course, notoriously controversial for claiming that Jesus was gay. Uh, and then for the purpose of this presentation, what, what is crucial and fascinating for me about him is when uh, he was in the process of being ordained, he had an intellectual wrestling process that he went through. And uh, here on page 120, he reflects on that. Um, let me just read us uh, one or two paragraphs that just helps us understand what he went through. He, he, he states, how could I with integrity make the declaration of assent agreeing to the Church of England's 39 Articles of Religion as agreeable to the Word of God. No doubt they were excellent for the 17th century. Actually, that is wrong. It should have been earlier uh, when they were composed, but they were out of date for the 20th century. And then he says, my integrity revolted at the thought. And yet, according to the law of the land, I could not be instituted unless I did. Uh, agree to them. I hit on the compromise of a supplementary declaration. I did that which was prescribed by law and then I went on to affirm that in making this declaration I was not subscribing to each and every article but affirming that they were agreeable to the Word of God at the time in which they were written. There is a certain cultural relativity about all doctrine. And then uh, he goes on explaining how the bishop was a bit upset, but there was no disciplinary action taken against him. And then surprisingly, the Archbishop Michael Ramsey contacted you in light of this controversy and invited him to join the influential doctrine commission of the Anglican Church. Uh, this commission was set up to explore and think through and try to amend or change or adapt doctrine uh, in the church uh, for all the uh, for all the vicars and future ordinance. And this was very interesting what happened there. Uh, so he explains on page 121 the whole process and what happened. And I think it's crucial for the whole conversation uh, to, to read just an extract from it. He says, since the Commission comprised representatives of different shades of the Church of England, it seemed that we were in an impasse when we, when we retired for the night after several meetings. But next morning, John Austin Baker, the chaplain of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, and later canon of Westminster and the Bishop of Salisbury, pulled out of his uh, hat a formula on which we could all 
agree. This is embodied in the present declaration of assent, which consists of neither assent to each and every article, nor of a general assent to them all. We affirm our loyalty to our inheritance of faith, which includes the 39 articles, the Book of Common Prayer and the Ordinal, as our inspiration and guidance under God and to the faith to which the historic formulae, quote, bear witness. Now that's crucial, bear witness. This gives a positive way of looking at the articles of religion without making them authoritative for us today. Now why is this crucial? It is crucial because what they did, they were able to engineer, if you may, a hermeneutical new way of reading the 39 articles and the, the promise that you as a vicar made, uh, what you will be faithful to. And we're going to see now the implications of what that new change resulted in after Montefiore. Okay, so, so let's then move on. Now, after all of this happened, we had, of course, in 1977, the very famous and notorious the, God, the Myth of God Incarnate book that was published. And this was controversial for many reasons, primarily because we had some theologians that were on the Doctrine Commission, like uh, Professor Wiles and Professor Ninnaham. Uh, who contributed to this book, and in their chapters they would renounce the virgin birth, the two natures of Christ, and you had other Anglicans like um, Michael Golder uh, and also Don Cupid, uh, and of course not a, 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 a Anglican vicar, but John Hick, who was a Presbyterian from Princeton, who basically also renounced the key doctrines that we find in the 39 articles. So now, how was uh, this whole debate uh, uh, fought in the media and so forth? Of course, as normal, you did have evangelicals like Michael Green uh, and uh, George Holloway um, and others who had petitions and had uh, letters written to the editors of evangelical magazines. Uh, but what is quite crucial is that when it came to debating the issue at Synod, uh, Professor Jeffrey Lumpy had an ingenious idea of trying to make sure that all the contributors to the myth book were not going to be censured or disciplined. So what happened, he stood up during Synod and at some point said, but everybody should first read the book. And uh, as we know, after that, they were not formal disciplinary action taken against any of these uh, Anglican theologians. Now, crucial uh, also at this point is one of the contributors to the Myth of God book was Michael Golder. Michael Golder was an ordained vicar, but he was at the extramural department of the University of Birmingham. And uh, we know that uh, Hugh Montefiore became bishop of Birmingham shortly after Myth appeared in 1977. So in 1978, when he became bishop, uh, there was controversy because Golder was in the Diocese of Birmingham. So what happened? Uh, they wrote a joint letter to the newspaper, the church newspaper in Birmingham, where Montefiore basically argued that Golder should be able to remain a vicar in the Church of England. Now, um, it is crucial to keep in mind all the doctrines that Golder renounced in the myth of God. Um, I'm busy with a research project on that, but more or less, he renounces the virgin birth, the atonement, the divinity of Christ, the bodily resurrection. He explains our psychological encounters. Despite all of that, Montefiore believed that he should still remain a vicar. How was it possible for him to say that? My theory is that I think it goes back to the changing of the doctrine that the Doctrine Commission worked on in 74 
uh, 70, uh, well, it was, it was a little bit later, but changing it and including the words bear witness, which gave some hermeneutical leverage for liberals to say that they agreed to the Declaration of Assent, while at the same time not believing the core doctrines of the 39 Articles, for instance. All right, so the next person after all these controversies here was obviously the the Bishop of Durham, David Jenkins, and I've got a whole pile of his books here that I can show you. Uh, this one was written by uh, David Jenkins and his daughter. She's a journalist as well today. Uh, and you had, you had dozens of books published at the time. This one was written by a journalist. You had, uh, for instance, the um, Warden of Tyndale House, you had Murray J. Harris, who wrote a little booklet, a very well-written little critique. Here I see is another uh, uh, article from The Guardian uh, of a bishop that also criticised uh, uh, David Jenkins. Now, David Jenkins, of course, was a, a established theologian who taught at universities. He published a number of other books before his ordination. Uh, I've got a couple of them here, and then here, here is his famous uh, biography, uh, published in 2002, uh, The Calling of a Cuckoo, quite infamous, of course, with the, there's some interesting discussions with Margaret Thatcher and the miners' strike and so on as well. Now, what is important for the purpose of this discussion where we are plotting the whole development going all the way to John Shepard's appointment recently. Um, so, obviously, most scholars who've studied the controversy knows that David Jenkins was misquoted about the idea of a, a conjuring trick with bones. He was misquoted to some extent, but that is to some extent irrelevant because later on he did go on to develop and articulate and publicly state his own skepticism about the MT2. Let me just give, give you one quote that really highlights this in this book that he wrote with his daughter on page 34. Quote, I do not deny any basic Christian doctrines. What I have openly declared and shall continue to maintain is that literal belief in the empty tomb are not basic to Christian doctrine. Uh, there are more examples, but this basically just summarizes the whole conversation and discussion with Jenkins. Now, what is crucial uh, in the development of this uh, debate further was in 1985, there was synod, a synod uh, uh, congregation or meeting, and of course, the bishops criticized J Jenkins without naming him, and they had a document that was signed, uh, but uh, Jenkins himself, actually, in one of the books, states that he was comfortable signing it because uh, the language that was used was so ambiguous that you could believe in the empty tomb or not, and you could still say you believe in the resurrection. But crucial was that during the debates, Archbishop Runshi, I hope I get that pronunciation right as well, he specifically said uh, that there should be room for the liberals, the skeptics, and the orthodox uh, within the church. And he then, uh, and that sounds uh, familiar, doesn't it? It sounds a bit like William Temple. Uh, that was pronounced by the archbishop. Uh, so in a sense, uh, and if I can just add something else to this, to, to thicken that plot, you also have David Jenkins who said that he, uh, he was able to articulate his skeptical views on the empty tomb because the room was created for that with the way in which the Declaration of Assent was changed to make it possible for him to hold these views. Now, that gives us a bit of a historical background for how it was possible for the recent appointment of Dr. John Shepard, who clearly stated on a YouTube uh, uh, short video that he does not believe that the resurrection was physical, it is a spiritual reality, and despite that, he was appointed by Archbishop Justin Welby to represent uh, the Anglicans in Rome. 
I hope this was helpful. If you've got any comments or things that you would like to add uh, or further conversations or YouTubes we should make in light of things that we have discussed, please feel free to leave a comment. And thank you very, very much for listening. Have a good day. Goodbye.